I'm so stuck on what James McDonald just preached. I can see it in some of your faces. Like, why did we move beyond that? We can't move past that. Like, the presence of God and, and this earning, uh, this earnest longing for the presence of God. I, I hope that's in you right now. I hope you really heard what he said. Like, like really heard. Like, he who has an ear, ha- you know, whatever. It is, you know, like that type of hearing. Like, I get it. I want it. I've got to have it. Man, I, I just, uh, that's the first time I've ever heard him preach. Um, I've known him for years. I've never heard him preach before. You know, usually you hear someone, you go, he sounds like, you know, and you can think of someone. And then there's James. <laughs> he sounds like himself. He's just, there's no one like him. He's just a freak of nature. Um, <laughs> you know, lately I've been uh, going different places and people will say very nice things. They'll go, hey, I've been following you on Facebook or following you on Twitter or following you on Instagram. It's changing my life. It's really impacting me. Thank you for those updates. And that's, that's so cool to hear. Problem is I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. And so people apparently just kind of make some of these things up and say they're me and, and, uh, and, 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 and we used to like get rid of them all. But recently some of my staff came to me and they said, hey, they're quoting good things. They're just quoting you, you know, do we need to shut them all down? And I said, yeah, I mean, it's just weird. I mean, isn't it weird to anyone that I'm not doing it and I'm not behind it? And, and, and yet it makes me think, I go, gosh, how many times do we have services and events where we quote him and we'll, we'll say things about him, but is he really behind it? Is he the one really moving through a person and saying these things? Or are we just standing up here representing him and, and, and we're harmless, we'll quote him, we'll say good things, but is he the power behind it? That's everything that James was preaching, was, was what Moses was saying. It's like, I've got to have you. I've got to have you. And I'm back there listening to his message going, God, I don't want to walk on this stage and then just give some message. Man, i got to have you. I, I want to know that you're behind it and that I'm not just quoting you and I'm not just saying some things about you that are harmless, that are from Scripture. But God, I want your presence I really want you to rend the heavens right now, God. Man, my goal is I, I, I want to know that God is behind me and, and walking through me and speaking through me, that this is going to be a spiritual experience. Man, and I hope that you right now are going, yes, please, don't waste our time. Don't waste your time just giving us some thoughts and some ideas in your head. We want to experience God right now. And what he was saying about how this happens when there's an earnest longing. Can we just, can we just together come before God right now and not, not just close our eyes and sit through a prayer, but can we like close our eyes and say, God, we actually long for you. Like we want to have you. Like we don't want to just end this thing on a sermon. We want to end with you, like something you are going to do right now, just like you did in the scriptures. Man, can you long for that with me right now? Will you pray with me? God, I just fear I'm going to go into sermon mode. And just do things that I know to do in the flesh. 
and not truly abide in you to where there would be fruit that lasts. God, just like Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to go. God, I don't want to preach a sermon if your presence is not with me, if your spirit is not truly moving through me, God. I don't want to just teach through another passage, God. Please, may your power move. May you truly be in our presence, God. God, I ask for that, and I'm not even sure I know what that would look like. Like you and all of your power moving right now in our hearts. Please, Father, our churches are just in a desperate situation. God, we have replaced you, God, with other things that work and get us by. It's so stupid. God, I've done it. God, help us to truly repent and desire you or nothing at all. Please, Father, open our eyes to the truth. Show us how powerful you are and how you are enough, more than enough. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We worship you right now. We're all breathing here because of you, Jesus. We can only think right now because you allow us to. Please move amongst us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. A friend of mine called me about a month ago. He's one of my heroes, maybe my biggest hero if I had an earthly hero on the earth right now. Um, this would be the guy. He, uh, he's from India. He, he, he's led about three million people to the Lord through his ministry. He plants on average 17 churches a day. That's a lot. 17, he just, just, but he just knows God. He loves the Lord. And I just, anytime I can be around this man to learn from him, I love it. But he called me the other day and he was crying. He was crying over, over another pastor here in America, big church who fell into immorality. We've heard the story over and over and over again. And so it surprised me that he was in tears because in my mind, I just get cynical and I just expect it. And yet he's weeping over this. But as he's weeping, he just, he just saying, he goes, Francis, I don't get it. Some of the pastors, so many of the pastors I meet in your country, I, I walk away going, man, I wish he knew Jesus. Jesus, I wish he really knew him and he wasn't saying this in a judgmental way, he's crying. And he goes in the people, the people in your churches, it seems like they're content to hear from Moses rather than going up the mountain themselves. And that phrase just stuck with me. I go, he's right. Like he, he's saying, man, they want to just, they just want to talk to someone who's been with God and they don't realize they can actually go up the mountain themselves. Then on Friday, I was with another pastor from another country and he, he said, uh, he says, I've been looking at studying movements of God, and he goes, I've noticed that movements start when the founder of the movement really knows God. He says, but then movements die when the followers only know the founder. I thought, this, this is it, this is, this is the problem. This is this ongoing sermon that God has been preaching here 
That the problem is not technique, the problem is not strategy, the problem is that we don't know him. That we're not really going up the mountain ourselves. We're content to hear from another speaker or podcast another guy or read another book when, when, when what the scriptures teach us. I can, actually, I can literally walk up that mountain. I can come into the presence of him. I can actually see his glory, but we're content just taking selfies with Moses and writing about it. Say, hey, I got to meet this guy. I got to meet this person. And then pretty soon we have these people in our churches that are content to just hear from you when they could be going up the mountain themselves. I want you to think right now, how close are you to God? I mean, if I could ask God himself how close you are to him, what would he say? When's the last time you walked up the mountain yourself and you just were in awe of his glory, where you just sat there and thought, God, I cannot believe I am your child. I cannot believe I'm in your presence right now. How's your relationship with God? My family's been out of town the last couple of days. This rarely ever happens. Um, I've got five kids, and uh, so my house is usually loud and uh, but my family was away and I just thought you know what for 48 hours let me just turn off my cell phone let me shut down the computer let me lock the door nothing just God you and me I miss you I miss you and it was crazy how just the, the first few hours, how I just had a tendency to walk over to the phone, even though it was off, or run to my computer. Like, like I couldn't switch my mind off. I'm just used to going from one person to another. But after a while, I could just finally break through and go, okay, no one's coming in here. No one's getting a hold of me. It's just me and God. It's just me and God. And just me being able to go to the creator and go, God, I've missed you. Man, when's the last time you had some time like that with him? Where's just you and him? In Isaiah 30, verse 1, it says, Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, and who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. God says to these people, he goes, man, because you're so stubborn. You, you, you make all these plans. You start thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And he goes, you never even asked me. You never even asked if this was my direction. You didn't even ask if I was behind it. You just start quoting me. You just start doing this. You start filling in the gaps here and there. He goes, does it matter that I'm not behind this? And then later on in, in verse, uh, gosh, I can't even tell what verse that is. I think it's 15. It says, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, no, we'll flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away, and we'll ride upon steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five you shall flee till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. 
He says, you guys, you're gonna run, try all these different plans. He goes, you don't realize all you really need to do was to rest in me. He goes, so I'm gonna wait. I'm just gonna wait. I'm gonna wait till you try all these things and see how they're not gonna work. And maybe at some point you'll go back to maybe where some of you started, where you just said, God, you know what? If you're with me, I'm good. That's all I need. As long as I know you're with me, I'm okay. I I'm just gonna wait for you. I'm good. You know, during my time alone with the Lord, Start reading through the book of Revelation, start reading through the book of Romans, Ephesians, just praying through it all. And God was just showing me some painful things. Um, he was showing me that I was still insecure in my love relationship with him that there was still this side of me that's still chasing after something. Like maybe if I do this right, maybe if I do a little bit more here, I don't think I'm accomplishing more and I'm running, 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 running. And some of that was out of just insecurity in my relationship with God. And it feels very awkward to say that to all of you, given I'm the speaker. Um, but I, I, I wrestle with insecurity. I don't know, there's just times where I, I start doubting whether God loves me. And it's a, it's a terrible thing to do because then you start working, but then when you start working at it, you realize, okay, if I work and feel like I'm earning it, then that's pride. And it's like the Lord makes you lay down and say, no, you, you can't earn this. Don't you understand that? So arrogant. And he just, once again, as he has many times, because this is my struggle, helped me fight for that security again. And just had to be reminded of the gospel again and of the cross again. And I just wonder, I just wonder how many people in this room are resting right now, just completely sure that Jesus loves you deeply. And how many here are still working out of an insecurity like I tend to drift back into? And I just want to remind you of the cross again. This is what I'd like us to dwell on as we finish out this conference is the cross of Jesus Christ. Over Easter, I was, I was preaching out of Mark 14 and I just wanna go through it again. I, I, don't, I don't know what does it for you, but for me, the, the cross does it. But, but maybe, you know, there's, there's one passage that hits me maybe even more than the cross and it's the garden. It's, it's the garden as Jesus is preparing for the cross and he's getting there and the, there's that scene in, in Mark 14, verse 34. It says, he said to them, where Jesus said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Where Jesus is looking at his disciples, he goes, oh, my soul, my soul. It's, it's killing me right now. I am so sad right now. I feel like I'm gonna die. I'm sorrowful to the point of death. Think about your savior who's on earth going, gosh, I feel like I'm gonna die right now because my soul is in so much agony. And it says, going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Okay, we're not just talking about some guy, like Jesus is listening right now. Jesus is with us. He is omnipresent. Whether he's manifesting himself here or not, we'll find out. But, but, but we're talking, let's not talk about a person as though he's not here or he doesn't notice. We're talking about him, a person, 
And that's what this is about, about a person, a real person who at one point was saying, oh, my soul is killing me. And then he took a couple steps and he just falls on his face and asks if God could take this cup from him. And, and, and he, says, he says in the next verse, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Man, think about that statement. He's looking at his father and going, Father, Daddy, everything's possible. You can do anything. Remove this cup from me. Man, the Bible talks about how he was sweating drops of blood. The Bible talks about how he didn't just do this once, he did this three times. I mean, most of us have children. Imagine your child looking at you and going, Dad, I feel like I'm dying right now. Come on, you can do anything. You're able to do anything. Don't make me go through this. Take this away from me. Your kid sweating drops of blood saying, I feel like I'm gonna die right now. Everything inside is just killing me. Now don't make me go through it. Imagine your kid screaming to you three times, let him remove this cup from me, and then finally go, okay, but not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And then Isaiah 53, 10 says that it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Did you catch that? Jesus begging the Father and going, okay, but not my will, your will be done. And the Father's going, okay, my will, my will is to crush you. God, a real being in heaven, is looking at us and, and, and looking at Jesus going, it's my will to crush you. You're going to be that guilt offering so that you can be the firstborn of many. God's looking at us, God in heaven, almighty God, that, that David Platt gave 27, you know, things to praise him for. Like that being said, oh, my will is to crush you. I see you crying out for me. I see you sweating drops of blood. I see you in agony and you're begging me, but my will, I'm gonna crush you. I'm gonna save them. I'm gonna save them. And that's why we come here and we go, man, I'm not going to praise any person up there. Lord, you went through that for us. And we think we're going to add something to that. And we want people to look at what we've done. No, we're going to look at the glory of the cross. That's why Paul says, you know, all the things that I've done, and I've done way more than everyone in this room. He goes, all the things that I've accomplished, he goes, I count them. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He goes, I have to look at everything I've ever done and just look at that as a big plate of dung, a big plate of rubbish in order that I might, I, might, I might be found in him, having a righteousness that's not of my own. Go, man, I could, I could have that. So Jesus, on that cross, God made him who knew no sin become sin on my behalf, that I might become the righteous of God through him. Well, I want that righteousness. If, and what that requires is for me to take everything I've ever done, and I, I have to count it all rubbish, everything that I think I am in the flesh, all of that is all junk in order that I may be found in him. I'm going... I want to be found in Jesus. I just want to be found in Jesus. God, I'm nothing. Nothing I've ever done. Nothing I've ever done earns me anything. It's all garbage. It's all rubbish. Everything is about the cross, the cross, the cross. And I rest in the cross. Are you resting in the cross right now? Is your joy in the salvation that comes from Jesus?
one of my daughters, she's, uh, she's 14, and she was going to go on a mission trip this summer to Cambodia. She would spend the summer away from us in Cambodia. This was a couple months ago, and, and uh, she couldn't figure out what to do because there started to be some conflicts on her team, and she couldn't read the situation going, gosh, should I still go? Is this a sign from God not to go? And she was telling us about the situation, so I thought about it, and then the next day I just thought, you know what, let me, let me tell her what to do. Because, you know, I mean, she's 14. I'm 46. Um, I wrote Crazy Love. I, I, I know a lot of stuff. And uh, the next day, I, I, I look at my daughter, I go, Mercy, so, so uh, let's, let's talk about your trip to Cambodia. And um, have you thought it through anymore? In my mind, I had the solution for her. And she says, well, Dad, I, I've decided I'm just going to fast and pray for a week, and then I'm going to make the decision on Saturday. And I said, <laughs> All right, I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know why? Because I'm going to bet on that 14-year-old girl to come up with the right conclusion rather than me. If she's going to fast and pray for a week, who are you going to bet on, me or her? You know, and I, I look at everything we just learned about Moses, and, and there were probably scholars that were way more brilliant than Moses. There were probably strategists that, were, that, that could figure out plans way better than Moses. But who are you going to put your money on? The one that's been in his presence. And I don't want to get beyond this point. I, I just think God's bringing us to a point. There's no point in just throwing out a bunch of other random thoughts to you right now. I just got to ask, do you guys know him, man? Like, do you really, do you really long for him? Because, man, sometimes I just want to walk in a church building and hear the guy up front pray like he, he's really talking to someone that he knows rather than just as a cue so that the band can walk on or, or just as a transition or just because it says on the schedule prayer time. Man, if you're an unbeliever and you walk into this place of worship, don't you ever walk in and go, man, that guy up there almost scares me. Like there's some sort of connection he has with God. It's like when he prays, stuff happens. It's driving me crazy. I don't know God like that person knows him. Man, is that what people see when they come to your church? They just, or they just in awe. Like, man, you know him. You know him. He listens to you. Man, seriously, I, I, I'm listening to the message before for mine, and I know I keep referring to it, but it's really messing me up because I'm, I'm looking at the crowd as he's talking. I'm going, Lord, do they, are they getting this? Are they getting this? This is so huge. This really is the problem in our churches is people aren't going up to the mountain. They're not really coming into the presence of God, and it starts with us, and we're busy with so much stuff. But man, look, what is this Bible about? It's about people who depended on God, right? I mean, it's about people who said, I don't care, all the, all the cards are stacked against me, but I know God, so I'm, I'm okay. It's, it's about Gideon. Remember Gideon, he, he, he saw fire come down from heaven, but that wasn't enough. He's like, well, well, show me the fleece, make it wet. No, 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 make it dry. You know, just, just and we get on him like, like, man, why does he need to test God over and over? No, but once he knew God's with him, once he figured it out, he's like, okay, anything. You want me to fight with 30,000 people? That's fine. 10,000, that's fine. 300, I don't care. I don't care. You're with me, so I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, you're with me. I, I, I don't care. As long as your presence is with me, I don't care if I have 300 men, I'll do it. This, this, this book is about, is about Jonathan in, in 1 Samuel 14. 1 Samuel 14, when the armies of Saul are hiding in a cave, and he just looks, you know, and the, the Philistine army's up there, and he just looks at his armor bearer. He goes, how about you and I go? Just you and me. And he says in verse 6, he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. He just goes, I don't care. If it's me, you, and God, that's, that's, that's more than he needs. That's what this book is about. It's like people who really believe still. 
It's, it's like David, after they took his wives and, 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 and you know, they get back to Ziklag and, and all, every, all his whole army, their, all their families were taken. And it says that they were all crying till they had no strength left. And then suddenly all the people, all the people started looking at David, all the soldiers going, let's kill him. It's his fault. And what does it say? It says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. He had his own army against him. He was weeping the loss of his family. Everyone, everything was gone. And now his own men are ready to kill him. And David's like, okay, God, I need you right now. You and me, you and me. And he comes out of that time going, okay, I'm good. Let's go. Because that's what this book is about. It's about people who say, look, I, Paul, just going, I just want to know him. All I need to do is know him. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of, of sharing in his sufferings. Man, I, I'm good. At that, for me to live, this is, this is all it is, is to know that he's with me. Like, is that you right now? Because you can have the promise. And what, what's your promise land? A, a big church? Think, God, if I could have a big church, if I could write a book, if I could have this staff, if I could have this worship, li- oh, what is it? What do you want? Or do you want to just walk on a stage and go, gosh, I just know God is with me right now. No way. God's with me right now. His presence is with me. He loves me. He adores me. This is good. I can do anything. I mean, is that your confidence right now where you're going, you know what? I'm secure. I'm secure in the cross. I'm resting in him. He loves me. The Lord's my shepherd. I, I, I don't want I don't want for anything. I'm totally content with him. I mean, is that you right now? Is that what the people see in you? It's just the security of this man or woman of God that just says, I'm completely content right now because I know God. I went right past Moses. I saw him on the way down. I just went up the mountain and just stood in awe of God and said, God, that's all I need. Would you just, would you just bow your heads right now for a second? Would you just earnestly long for God right now? Just confess if you've been longing for too many other things and striving for too many other things. And right now, just tell God you want to be close to him again. God, would you move right now? God, we can't make anyone fall in love with you. It's a spirit who gives life the flesh is of no help at all. 
God, I pray that by your spirit you would open our eyes, Lord, if we've just been practicing religion. If we just go through steps and we just do things that we were taught by someone else, but we don't truly come into your presence and just worship you, God, would you make us hunger for that? Make us discontent with anything less than that. God help us. Would you look up at me for a second? I just need to say something right now. I don't know what it is. Okay. I preach every week. I do conferences like this every week. And there's just something today that I feel here with this conference specifically. And I I don't know how to put a finger on it. Honestly, there's a part of me that's going, uh, it's just not. Oh, and like, like, and I can't even explain it. And honestly, the last time I felt this was the last time I spoke at the Southern Baptist Convention. And I don't know what it is. I'm not accusing or saying anything, but, but I, I think, I don't know, sometimes, like, I, I'm not trying to be judgmental or whatever, but, but sometimes I feel like you guys... I don't even mean you guys. I mean, it happens a lot, but there's, there's like patterns and there's like things that we do and there's just these rituals and things that we learned and that were passed on. And, and sometimes I can see like an emptiness in the eyes while the actions are, are there, but I'm not seeing like, like inside your heart, you're just dying. Like inside your heart, you're thinking, man, people are going to hell. I got to do something. I got to save them. I don't see anything your eyes like, man, I don't know God. I gotta know him deeper and deeper. And there's like, there's not this longing. And, I, and please take this in the right way, man. It's like freaking me out that I'm even saying this to you right now. It's just just the heart, the hunger. I, I see a lot of ritual, a lot of maybe faithfulness over the years, but I'm concerned that there's not this desperate like cry for like, God, Man, I just feel like I walk in the service sometimes and I feel like it's so dead, God. I gotta have your power, I've got to have your presence. And maybe I've substituted it by just going through the service order another week and I, I just feel like, God, I, I so don't wanna get out of my, off my knees and say this to you, but I, I, I just had to say something and I, I don't know if that resonates with some of you that I, I remember sometimes where I would sit in a service and where I'd sit in a church church service and everything inside of me just wanted to scream like there's more, there's more. There's something in me that's just dying to get out. I read what happened in the word and I know there's more and I've gotta pursue it. So I'm gonna go up that mount and I'm gonna pursue that. Even if it seems like the people around me don't get it, I've gotta pursue it. And I just think that there are some of you here that are listening to this and going, man, that's me. I, I feel like I read God's word when I get alone with his word. It's like, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, there's more. But then I walk back into an environment where maybe I'm, we're just used to certain things and I, I'm scared to, to change things or mix things up. And um, there, I just said it. I, I, I just, man, please understand my heart in this. This is in no way, I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and so I've, I've felt these feelings sitting there as a kid, 
and going, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. And God, help me pursue this. Help me to lead the people beyond this. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. It seems like everyone else is okay with this, but I'm not. There's got to be more. And I just pray that if some of you hear that, that I'm not talking about blowing up the church or doing anything crazy. I'm just saying, man, I really believe that's of the Lord, that when you look in the scriptures, you see there's more available and to don't sell for less. Man, I believe that that burning in you is from the Holy Spirit and that it's not okay to just be fine with the unreached people groups out there and people going to hell. It's not okay to just sing another song and finish out the service and tie it up right and just have another year of services, but that we would just say, you know, God, I gotta have you. I gotta have you. I gotta experience what I read about in this book. And that's my prayer for you. And I, I, I don't mean to be offensive. I hope you understand where my heart is. And I hope that, that those who have ears to hear really will just go, you know what? I, I heard that. I've been hearing that. And I'm gonna go home and actually do something about that. And that's my prayer for you guys.